Welcome back, Talk Addicts. I <laughs> uh, hope everybody had a nice Christmas. I know I've uh, probably gained a pound or two. Uh, this afternoon, I want to kind of unwind a bit. My buddy Walker called me and said, I want to go pitch a few plastics for trout. And we did probably around 2.30, 3 o'clock this afternoon. And we got there. The bite was on right away. Caught 12 nice trout, and it died. I mean, it it turned off as quick as it turned on when we got there. Uh, the uh, few porpoise were out there running around. I don't know if that spooked them or what, but I believe what happened was we were right at the top of the high tide, and when it got to that point, the tide wasn't moving anymore, they quit. And uh, you got to have movement for them to really bite. But we had a good time anyway. We catch and release only. Uh, I did have something that I think I've talked about before that I left a little pouch in the truck that had some extra little supplies on me. And one of them was my monofilament line in case it would have break. And also uh, a little thing of super glue. Well, I was pitching a electric chicken, got it hung up, couldn't get it loose. And we were fishing from the bank. We were walking a bank. We weren't in a boat or anything where I could go in and maybe run the rod down to it and knock it loose. But I lost it. It broke. It broke actually at the Albright knot. The mono broke. The knot did not break, and uh, which showed us a pretty tough knot. But I couldn't redo it, and I didn't have any extra mono with me since we were walking the bank, not in my boat. And I tied it directly to the braid. I caught a few more fish, but I didn't seem like I was getting as many strikes as often with the braid. Uh, maybe some of you guys can comment as to whether it makes a difference with, with y'all or not is whether you tie your braid directly to your lure or you use a, a, a monofilament leader. I'm now going down to a, a 12 pound mono leader and I tie about maybe seven feet. Actually, I get it where it goes in just before the spool on my spinning reel. And then I let maybe about 15 inches hang off the end and that gives you what I consider a good whip action to get a lot of distance. Uh, but I, when that, once that lure I lost that lure. I tried to put a Z-Man uh, electric chicken on by Strike King. I think Strike King may have Z-Man make those lures for him. And I always heat up a little piece of uh, stainless steel. I have about the diameter of a number two pencil. I stick it in the head of the bait, melt it, so that way that Z-Man material will easily slide up on the head of the jig. And I was pitching, I started off pitching a quarter ounce jig head. And uh, I just put one or two little small drops, like I've told you before, of a Loctite, push it on there, give it about 10 to 15 seconds, and those fish can't pull it off. And then when you go to throw it, once it starts to get a little worn, it won't slide back on the hook. That's a, that's a good tip on that, doing that. But all of a sudden, I think they just, they just quit. So we fished up to almost half an hour before dark, and we quit. Uh, I want to go over a few comments tonight. One of them I uh, got from uh, Male Mouse 198 says, can you clean buffalo and carp the same way? Boneless, just curious if it's the same technique. Uh, I don't, I've never cleaned a carp. I'd have to cut on it and see. I'm assuming the, the, the rib cage may have a few more bones in it. Now, since I've never done, I couldn't see it. And, and since I haven't cut one, the bones may like in a, a tail of a jack or a pike or a shad that has thousands of bones in an American shad, they may run into the meat. But I've never done it. If you if you have tried it and hadn't had any success, how about letting me know in a comment and uh, what may have been your difficulty or you just gave it up. I'd also be curious to know how people would cook that fish, whether the, 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 the buffalo or the carp. I'd be interested in how they cook it. Uh, the other comment I want to go over is from Ben Barry. He said, uh, he meant to say, you were talking about fishing drops. Why, when you ask a person, how did you do? And they say, good. Uh, they won't really tell you where the drop is. My wife and I can't catch all the fish, just enough for me and her. Well, <laughs> it seems like there's fewer drops. I think I've mentioned this before, Ben, but there's, there's more and more boats and people out there fishing. And I'm going to tell you, you're not going to catch fish every time you go. You're going to have to, to really study, watch people. I got a buddy of mine. He goes out on a Saturday. He rides around with a cup of coffee. He, he just sees where a lot of these old timers are fishing. 
and he marks the spots. And then you not only just want to mark the spot, you want to find out what's the tide movement at that. Is it, is it top of the high tide? Is it just starting to go out or the bottom of the high tide? There's a lot to do with the current flow as to whether you're going to catch fish or not. So just knowing the drop doesn't mean you're going to catch fish, especially when it's offshore fishermen and they, they supply in numbers. There's a lot more to it. It, take, it takes a lot of practice. Uh, I got another comment from uh, Captain Ricky in Florida. Uh, how is it going? Your fillet videos are awesome. Uh, I thank you, Captain. Uh, also, let me know where, where do you live in Florida and, and what kind of fishing do you like to do? And what's your favorite time of the year for what you do fish for, whether you're fishing offshore, inshore, or whatever? Uh, we'd like you to keep the comments coming and, and uh, don't forget to, to uh, ask questions. Uh, we talked earlier about my buddy Walker and I going out fishing, and I'm not going to bust him out right here right now, but I'm going to ask everybody out there, and if you don't know this answer, don't look it up, but just come back, and I'll tell you tomorrow if you don't know the answer to this question. Do you know what the spleen is on a fishing rod? And if you do know, tell me. If not, Right, just comment in and I'll address your name or names and explain to you what the spleen is on a fishing rod and why you have to have the right reel with the right rod. Uh, another thing I want to go over, my buddy Mike gave me, me and my wife Monica, some interesting books tonight. Uh, one of them for Christmas, one of them says, in, uh, to avoid, to verify, written away, let me say, wait a minute, incredible and true fishing stories. You don't see this. I can't wait to read it. It should be very interesting. And the other one uh, for Monica was forward by Ted Williams, fish on, fish off. And I'll tell you a story about Ted Williams and his batting and how well he did. For those who don't know who Ted Williams was, the younger guys, look him up. One of the best baseball hitters ever, ever came down to Pike. Uh, I talked about earlier on catching and releasing you don't need them, let them go. Uh, there's a book called The Old Man and the Boy. A friend of mine, Ryan, down in New Orleans, Ryan Fritz, he told me about this book years ago. We were actually on a fishing trip down in uh, Nicaragua, I mean, excuse me, a duck hunting trip in Nicaragua. And we got to talking about books. And he said, it's been his most enjoyable book to read. And I'm now reading it for my second time. The Old Man and the Boy. It was copywritten in... Uh, Oh, well, let's see. First originally copywritten in 1953, and it last was, uh, with this book, I think it was 1993. And what the old man teaches this boy right off is with quail hunting, how to preserve the, the cubby. And you have to do the same thing. If you come up on a drop and you do well on it, don't empty the drop. Don't, don't fish it till it's dry. Catch what you need, leave it there. So then next time, people like Ben, if he sees you on the drop, he goes, he can catch a few fish. Uh, I don't think I have too much more to go over other than, uh, again, I want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas. I know it's a couple of days late, but I took off for Christmas Day and the next day, uh, Christmas Eve and the next day, rather. I uh, got a nostalgia tip, and the nostalgia tip tonight was, <clears throat> do you remember when stuff from the store came without safety caps and the seals on it because someone, <clears throat> because no one had yet tried to poison a perfect stranger. And uh, I remember when it first started was with the Tylenol scare. I don't know how many of y'all remember that, but uh, it was not too long after that. I went and I used to do a lot of running. I went to New Orleans and ran a Halloween race there one year. And uh, in the process, probably <laughs> half of the people were dressed in Tylenol capsules, which I thought was kind of weird. But uh, they were talking about how much of that was going around in those days. And now everything you buy is sealed. And if anyone out there can tell me, why do they take small items today and put them in a large plastic package? Let me know. OK, guys, I'm going to end up here and, and with the, uh, the end of... Uh, Telling you, please leave questions and comments. I'm going to go back here and, and try to write in and type in the ones who, who comment after our blog here. 
And don't forget to go to the website and influence the link in the description and uh, give us a thumbs up, hit the bell and subscribe. And uh, I think that's going to about wind it up tonight. Don't forget, take a kid fishing and you can't catch them from the couch. Have a good evening.